Good day to you. My name is Tony Ballinger from the Fighting Men of Rhodesia series. Uh, we have as a special guest today, Greg Ashton from the South African Defence Forces. Uh, he was in Special Forces and D Squadron SAS, which is uh, pertinent to us. Um, and if you've seen from previous episodes, anybody that fought in Rhodesia or fought for the Rhodesian Security Forces from South Africa is more than welcome to come on this channel and have a chat. And um, I think what we're going to hear will be very interesting and illuminating to a lot of us. So welcome to you, Greg. Good to have you on the program. And, Thanks, Tony. Uh, we've just discussed you, but lovely weather there and beautiful weather here in England, which is very rare. I'm going to mark it on the calendar. Um, so going forward, uh, we just follow the same format, really, Greg. Could you give us um, some background of where you came from and who you are and your folks, where you went to school, etc.? Sure. Um, I was born, I'm still one of the baby boomers. I was born in 1959, a little bit younger than you. <laughs> um, born in Johannesburg. Uh, both my parents were artists. And when I say artists, my father was in advertising, uh, which um, was uh, something he'd learned when he uh, came back from the war. He'd been in the Air Force in 21 Squadron. He'd served in North Africa and in Italy. Um, he was my hero when I was young. Uh, you know, you hear those war stories and everything mm. else that's great about it. Well, so we think it's great. And uh, he started in a new sort of discipline in the market called advertising. And um, so he was a senior creative director in advertising. My mom had gone that route as well, but also being the mother of three kids, she could not uh sustain that so she became a fine artist and she did exceptionally well as an artist um uh, mostly portraits but a lot of landscapes as well um and we lived in uh, johannesburg on northcliff hill in those days where we were based it was still fairly wild from beyond where we were um if you looked out on the hill northcliff hill is quite prominent in johannesburg for those of you who do not know there's a water tower on top and we used to clamber up the 150 meters or so to the water tower and from where we looked there were farms about 10 or so kilometers away maybe even less and we could see giraffe and we could see wildebeest and various antelope and so on there today that is a built-up area and the built-up area stretches well beyond that so that is sort of where i was mm -hmm. born i had an elder brother mark uh, who's passed away now and i've got a younger sister tracy um we then moved to our farm that we had um, down in the old Eastern Transvaal, which is in Pumalanga now. And it was a banana farm with a few other crops. My parents decided they wanted to give us a better upbringing. Um, I think a change of scenery in terms of their career was also something that they really wanted to uh, try and attempt. And I think that's what happens when you become a parent. You decide you want something slightly better. So in 1963-64, we moved down, sold a house here and moved down to the country. We stayed in somebody else's uh, house, farmhouse while they were away, uh, while our house was being built also up on a hill. We had the most magnificent view mm -hmm. and the world was my oyster. Brilliant. He has a little boy of three or four years old, been introduced to an area which was pretty wild. Where our farm ended, there was a lot of the forestry areas uh, had started very much like the eastern highlands of uh, Zimbabwe and um, I just yeah. loved it you know we had all the antelope and buck you wanted from kudu to daika yeah. to bushbuck um, occasionally we had lion which used to come our way from the Kruger National Park up our yeah. way uh, not often but they were there in occasion a lot of leopard um, and every kind of snake and any, any kind of bird and on there. So that is what I grew up with. My well, I, elder I, idyllic life, eh? absolutely idyllic. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And I always think of that book, Old Yeller, uh, about the little boy going out and with his hunting rifle and things like that. And very early, I had to learn how to use um, our rifle. We had a two two four ten combination mm -hmm. over and under. Um, and, um, you know, a rifle is a tool, like a gun is a tool. Um, often people say, are you dangerous because you've used firearms or you might carry a firearm? I said, give me a spade and I can show you where I'll bury you as well and chop you up into it. Okay, that's speaking in jest. <laughs> but but it's a tool. It's exactly the same. Of course, yeah. And you have to treat it with respect. You have to clean it and look after it. So my brother went off to boarding school in Pretoria to Pretoria Boys High. Um, and when I was old enough, I went to the local school there. 
um, Afrikaans school, 100 kids. I was number 101 and I was English speaking. Uh, even though my mom was Afrikaans, uh, we spoke English at home. And her, strangely enough, her first language was Zulu. So I spoke Zulu better than <laughs> Afrikaans for the first few years until the Afri my Afrikaans was a lot better. And eventually it became better than my home language because you converse with everybody in Afrikaans. Um, and put me at odds with my culture, which is half Irish, half Afrikaans. So go figure. A big so, walk going on there. <laughs> um, exactly. So I... I I, ha I had the opportunity with the dogs. Uh, we had two dogs and I take the rifle when I was, this is when I was old enough. And I say to my mom, bye mom, I'll see you in two or three days. And she said, where are you going to be going? And I said, you see that hill up there? And I'd point to something about um, three or four miles away. It was very hilly. Um, and I said, if there's any problem, you will see smoke coming from that hill there. Um, there was a road nearby. So if there was a problem, she could always drive around on the dirt road and hoot you know, beetle and she can come and check up on me and make me always fine. But you know what? We were always fine. You know, it's one of those things. You learn how to avoid snakes. You avoid the dangers. You don't make fires where you can't. And if you learn that at a very early age, you have respect for the bush. You learn to love the bush. And for me, just absolute heaven. It became so bad that when we had guests that come around, I'd run away and go and spend time in the bush. I didn't want to see them. I, I became very much insular in many respects. Anyway, this is um, incredible. I mean, that's a real jock of the bushfall story right there. I reckon you could write some a book on that. Um, okay, couldn't you? I suppose I could. Strangely enough, my father's second name was Percy because his uh, great godfather was Percy Fitzpatrick. So there's a little bit of history going back there as well. Gee, what a lifestyle! Fantastic. So um, then I went to uh, boarding school. Um, after that, for the last years of high school, uh, primary school in a town called white river and um, that was really really difficult um because the difference between english and afrikaans was very marked and um the afrikaners used to pick on us you know it's funny people talking today say but you didn't have the prejudices and things like that that they have today no we, we had the same if you remember it was only 20 years or so after world war ii and south africa was very much uh, divided. A lot of people supported Germany because of the old historical background of the the Boers and the Dutch and the German influence. And with South Africa then being part of the Commonwealth in those days and people being forced to go and fight in uh, then German Southwest Africa, um, it created problems back in South Africa. But at that after the war, 20 years after, people still hadn't buried the hatchet and it was very much the English against the Afrikaans. Mm. And uh, you've got to learn at a very early age to fight for yourself. Mm. Uh, did you ever read that book, The Power of One? No, but I've heard of it. What, what's that about? It's about a guy who gets picked on in South Africa. I think he also came from Rhodesia uh, in those days and he gets picked on by Afrikaans guys and they try and beat him up um, We because he was at boarding school and you know he had a single mom. So any anybody who might want to read that book, it is really worthwhile in terms of going uh, back in time. I know they made a movie. I think Morgan Freeman was in the in the movie. I can't remember who else. Wow. But it's pretty much a lot uh, the same thing. And turn uh, until I learned to stand up for myself, my father decided that I needed uh, to learn something. I wasn't very. I wasn't a big guy in, in those days. Um, I I played a lot of sport, but in primary school I was still a real wimp, and um, I could not do certain things because you you don't value yourself you don't think you're capable i was useless at cross country and i was fairly good at cricket fairly good at soccer um and that was about it i don't want to play rugby because it, for me it wasn't sort of something i wanted to do until i got to high school obviously that changed um but then my dad sent me off uh to go and learn some self-defense i joined the local karate club um and i worked my way up I think by the time I left primary school, I must have been like a, a green belt, something like that. I know I was due to go for the next grading, but it taught me confidence more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And one of the big Afrikaans guys by the name of Reno tried to pick on my friends and I. And I had a friend called Chris Hamilton, who was a lot smaller than me. And um, I stepped in and Reno said, what are you going to do about it? And I did something that I shouldn't have done. I gave him a roundhouse, my washer Gary kick, and I knocked him down mm -hmm. flat. Well, needless to say, um, I never had anybody picking on me again. This is one of those things. And, you know, if, if push comes to shove, you do what you have to do. And I'm, I'm a pretty patient person. Um, I let things sometimes ride and ride and ride because I don't, not that I don't want to uh, confront an issue, 
but I often believe try and try the peacekeeping effort first and so on. But if not, um, you got to bear the consequences. Yeah. So that was it. I went off to English speaking high school in Nelspray called Lowfield High. Uh, when I went into my next grade, uh, or standard in those days, standard six. Very different. A lot of influence from Portuguese boys. Mozambique had just fallen in 1975. Uh, uh, in 1975, but there were a lot of people already coming over. Uh, so this was in 1968, 69, 69, I guess. Um, I don't, my record is my my memory in terms of dates is not that accurate. But anyway, I did the whole five years at high school, in boarding school. I loved it. It, it was a growth period for me. Um, didn't get out as much as I wanted to, to into the bush and so on, but where the f school had been built, it was out in the middle of nowhere. Today, it's right in the middle of a town. But in those days, we used to hop the fence and go out and go and pick up bugs and settle snares and traps and go and make fires on the hill and do things like that. That's what boys do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I started playing rugby in standard six and I did very well the first year. And um, so well, they said, you make flank and you could most probably end up making first team if you qualify at the end of the year. I broke my wrist very badly, my right wrist in a horse riding accident on the farm uh, over Easter. And I couldn't do anything with that because my arm was in plaster and because it was a complicated break, they said, we advise you not to play rugby. And by the time it had healed, the rugby season was more or less over. Next year, same thing happened, started. And now I was doing the... Uh, selection for first team. I got into the first team, uh, played one small exhibition match, went home for the Easter weekend, and lo and behold, I did the same wrist again on another horse, but this time I damaged my wrist and my jaw and ribs and things like that. So the guy said to me, that wrist is now permanently stuffed. Uh, unless you put steel pins in it, which would then prevent you from bending your wrist, you shouldn't play rugby again. So I did everything else. I did cross-country, gymnastics, swimming, and I became a real string bean. And uh, I wasn't the most academic type of person out there, but I, I, I did well. I did well enough. My parents had gone through a divorce when I was around about 11, and I know my mom was struggling. And uh, so I did the best I could. I was, the, I was a good boy, put it that way. Although if, if I were left to my own, I most probably would have done a whole lot more. But I think that tends to stick with you in terms of your reputation and you're not one of the guys who are playing rugby and first team cricket and things like that. So you're not seen as one of the the, the capable guys. And I remember in, in our final year in high school, um, we, the national conscription was um, very current at that stage, like it was in Rhodesia. We'd seen all of the uh, things of all the photographs and the news reports from what was happening in Rhodesia. I, I had friends that were up there, so it made it even more realistic in a way. But to me, it was still like another country. Mm. Little did I know what was going to happen. Mm. And um, I remember them coming around, the guys talking to us and said, what would you like to do when you go off to the army? I said, I'd like to become paratrooper. And scoff, laugh, scoff. I certainly wasn't the tough guy that was there. Anyway, um, finished uh, high school. Um, I got university entrance and I won got some bursaries as well to go to university, which was quite nice. I had one or two A's and... Um, I thought, well, the world is my oyster, but I have one thing to do. I have to go and do the two years of national service. In fact, it was still a one year, but as we went in, they increased it to the two-year period. Jeez. And for those who don't know, the South African structure was that you did your two years, and then for the next two years, you were obligated to do uh, 30 days a year, um, as in the territorial or citizen forced regiments. Mm -hmm. And they were all around the country because – South Africa was supposedly under attack by the communist forces that were outside. The ANC were the biggest at this stage, and they weren't doing that much, uh, 75, 76. But, you know, the, the government also kept us under wraps as far as propaganda was concerned. So we didn't know anything about the outside world. And when we started reading that, we realized that things were afoot and bigger things than we were aware of. But that only came to light later on. Mm -hmm. Everybody pro the government that we knew of. And, you know, I, I grew up and I had a a, a black friend. Uh, his name was Sablon. And although he was South African, um, born, born and raised, um, he was his, uh, of the Swazi tribe. I wanted him to go to school with me when I was in primary school. And I couldn't understand why he could not. Mm -hmm. I used to hurt cattle with him. I used to run around in a loincloth. I was friends with him. I used to do everything they used to do. And yet, you know, the government had said, no, you can't. You've got to go to this school and that's and they had to go to that school. 
So for me, I never sort of understood the political situation and obviously until I got older. Mm. But the people that you are living with and their friends and everybody else's friends and the school kids, everybody sort of gets indoctrinated by the same thing, whether or not they believe it or whether or not they are aware of what's happening. But there were a few people who were dissidents who uh, fought against and said, you don't know what you believe in, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm. I didn't know. I thought I was doing the right thing. And when it came around to uh, be mustered and go off to the defense force, I was doing it for, for the love of the country, mm. uh, for God and country, as they say. Mm. So on my 18th birthday, I arrived at a, um, an infantry regiment. I've been called up called uh, seven, uh, four Sai, fourth South African infantry regiment in Middleburg, which was not too far away from where we were. Uh, mm. We arrived by train. And my dreams and aspirations of the military world and the real world were shattered. I grew up in a very protective environment. My parents never swore. I never heard a swear word at all. I mean, not that they were church going. We went, you know, when there were funerals, weddings and special occasions. But here I was exposed to um, a sergeant and a corporal in charge of our troop. Boy, and I heard words that I never knew happened. I actually asked the guy what's he saying? You know, and the guy looked at me as though I was stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the real world. Anyway, I didn't stay there very long. Um, I always thought I'd like to better myself and do something else. And they had guys from signals and the guys from intelligence uh, who came around. So they're looking for people who would be interested. Then the paratroopers came around and um, they said they're looking for guys to go there, but we have to pass the number of tests. So we had to run and do push-ups and sit-ups and a number of other things. The guy stopped me when I got to 180 push-ups. I was fit and lean. I'd been training for this all the time. He said, you got it, you got it. So um, within a week, we were shipped out by train, went to Bloemfontein. In Bloemfontein, I did my basic uh, training um, as any soldier would. So you go through your, your basic period. And I think that is eight weeks or 12-week period. Uh, qualified with that. And before you go on to your counterinsurgency and your bush training, um, your bush warfare training. Um, when you're at the parachute regiment, they put you through the PD course. So you have to do PD course, which is quite tough. So it's two weeks of PT every day, Monday to Friday, and it whittles out the guys very quickly. It also makes you fitter. Um, and we were a week and a half through it when some other guys came to visit, the guys from one reconnaissance commando in those days. Um, so during our tea break, they gave us an extended tea break. They said, if you guys are interested, go down to where the auditorium is, go and watch the video and so on. And when you finish, come back. So I went down to go and have a look. And in those days, they had the most incredible, emotional and provocative movie, which they showed about a young guy and what he was doing and what the training gone through and real things. And it just, it whetted my appetite. I thought, this is what I want. So at the end of it, I said, anybody interested? My hand went up. I said, yes, please. I'm very keen. I'd like to do it. So I signed the paperwork and so on. They said, okay, before you do this, some tests. We've got to run. So we had to run a one and a half miler, which is a two comma four. Then do the sit-ups and the push-ups, all of those things. I creamed it. It was easy peasy. And uh, then they said, okay, um, we'd like to take you, but we can only collect you in a week's time. Uh, the train will arrange to take you out of here. So I thought, that's fine. Went back to the rest of the group, that, and now we're going to carry on with the PT course. And the guy looked at me and said, mm -mm. you want to desert us, eh? You want to be what they say in Afrikaans, a farayer. So you want to be a turncoat, and you want to go to the other side. You go and sit over there. And I remember the instructor looking at me like, and I said, I'll be back. A bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know? Yeah. I'll be back. I'll be back. Okay. It was a long, long before then. And he just laughed at me and shook his head. Anyway, um, we were shipped off to um, another regiment called 3 Sai, 3 South African Infantry Regiment, which is in Potterstrom. And uh, for those who don't know, Potterstrom is about uh, two hours drive from Johannesburg in a westerly direction. It's very flat, very open. Um, the equestrian center was based there, um, like Grey Scouts. And there were some of the um, armored um, regiments there as well. Nice and flat, open, good place for them to train. Did our pre-selection training there inside the same regiment. And we had instructors from One Reconnaissance Commando, which later on became One Reconnaissance Regiment, as a few years later. Um, and there must have been 180 of us. 
and they grilled us and we walked and we ran and we walked and we ran even on public holidays i remember one day we went in i think it was republic day or one other day another and we all went in had a big lunch with steak and sadza um, and a beer it was really nice and we came out sort of thinking it was a holiday and the guy said you think you're smart don't you fall in we did um punishment pt with a sandbag between the barracks for two hours eventually it was sadza meat and beer on what we were running and falling down they blow the whistle you pick it up and you run they blow the whistle you fall down then you leopard crawl they blow the whistle you get up and run and you did that for two hours i mean we, we were finished a lot of guys left that day because they just couldn't take it anymore anyway after the period that we had been there, which was about six weeks, we had to go off to the Military Medical Institute in Pretoria. And there they do all the evaluations, the medical stuff and the psychological stuff. And you put through all the tests and things that you need to do. Um, they don't tell you what the results are. Um, and then we came back. And then the day that we finished, they, you know, this is where they separate the goats from the sheep. And I was not a sheep. I was a goat. They said I was told I was medically unfit. I said, why? No, they couldn't answer that. Often it's like the police would say, no, we're not allowed to tell you that. No, they couldn't answer that or they didn't want to tell you. And I did not have much of a choice. My world was shattered. And I thought, well, what I'm going to do then is um, go and join the um, equestrian center. Uh, but I couldn't do that as a national serviceman. The only way I could do it is if I joined up the permanent force and go and signed up as a regular and another guy by the name of Rick Fandaro and I decided we were going to do that. Uh, but they had to post us out somewhere until they could arrange this for us. So they sent us to a regiment in Kimberley called 11 Commando, which is a normal infantry regiment. And we were there. And we were what in, fe what in effect they call uh, an RTU, a return to unit. But they don't send you back to your old unit that you came from. Yeah. Um, they, they just send you anywhere. I, I think it's like dartboard. They just select where you're going to go. Having that name on your file is one of the worst things you could ever have because generally you are deemed as unfit, uh, useless, whatever, and they just pick on you. And there were guys there who just loved picking on us. They just wanted to make our life a misery. So um, the uh, platoon corporal and the sergeant were real bunch of meanies. But Rick and I were fit. And what they do, they do punishment for us, punishment PT. We could outlast them. We would go with our whole platoon and the guys would say, um, you know, you got to run. And this is what they like doing. They're trying to break you down and try to build unity. Um, you know, run to that hill over there, go and collect a leaf from that tree, then that tree and this tree and so on. Eventually, I said to the guys, you know what? They, they're doing what they want to do with us. Let's take the leadership role here. So I said, okay, guys, we're going to collect every tree, a branch from every tree in every area around us so they can't send us back again. So we did that. The guys came back and... Um, so they said, you think you're clever, eh? Mm. Okay, go and get your kit, just Rick and I. Full kit, onto the parade ground, drill PT. The sergeant that was in charge of us, two and a half hours later, he, later, he killed over. He went into heat, heat exhaustion and had to be hauled off to hospital. And we were still fine. We were whistling tunes and things like that. Anyway, cut the story short. I ended up going to Pretoria to sign up uh, permanent force to go to the equestrian center. And when I got there, the guys who'd been on the group with me before had just finished their selection. So this was around about July. And they just finished their selection. And there were a lot of guys that I knew and they happened to be in Pretoria. And the guy said, oh, it's really great here. We're now starting our cycle as a special forces soldier. It's a nine month cycle you've got to go through. Uh, it's a bit longer today um, because they amended and adapted it. And I think now it's Close on 42 weeks. I think it's pretty long. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be that as it may. And I said, so what happens if I didn't pass selection or they deemed me unfit? They said, we have a support reg a support reg a support component. Like in any regiment that you have, the support component, and they support the guys who are operational. There's a lot that they can do. And in many instances, they're involved in the fight as well. So I thought, hey, okay, that's what I want to do. My friend Rick said, well, are you are you leaving now? I said, no, I'm not going to continue with you for the equestrian regiment. I think I'm going to go and speak to the guys at um, Special Forces HQ. So I said to the guy who is supposed to be uh, attesting us to sign up, I told him I know who I need to go and see where to go. He said, he doesn't know anybody. I said, give me a few days. Let me just stay here. So I went off to the HQ, Special Forces HQ, which is in the old building below the central prison, which is still there today. Very much like Sandhurst, those old type of buildings, double story, triple story buildings, the old Victorian type design. 
And um, I went to announce my presence. I said, I'd like to see General Lewitz, who was then in charge, a general officer commanding special forces. They said, you're going to have to wait. He's busy. They had an operation on the go at that stage. And obviously, he was involved in radio comms and with various officers that were coming through. So I sat outside uh, the office on a bench. There was a young uh, lieutenant, a young woman who was sitting there. She was like the edge, and she was controlling everything. Now, I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I don't even have a beret because I haven't even really qualified in my thing. So I'm just wearing a bush hat, and I'm sitting there, and everybody comes past. I stand up and salute and sit down. At least I know the difference between commissioned and non-commissioned officers. And there was this old guy who looked like Colonel Saunders from KFC in a black suit who was in and out every day, you know, white beard, uh, goatee, and so on, in and out. And I greeted yeah. him every day. And so on. <clears throat> on the third day, late in the afternoon, uh, the edge says to me, you can go in, the general's waiting for you. Good Lord, what a wait. So, yeah, so now I'm waiting. So as I'm doing that, this elderly guy comes past me like that. He says, follow me. You know, he must be the general secretary or aide de camp or something like that. So I follow him in. This office, massive office, Winston sofas on the one side, boardroom on the other side, world map, projections, things like this, and then display cabinets, and then drinks and things like that. And really nicely laid out there in the far side is a big window at the desk with a leather inlay and all of those things, three or four chairs in front of it. So I go to go and sit down, or stand there first until I'm given the permission to sit. And the old elderly gentleman goes behind. I thought, well, he's setting up for the general, and he pulls out the chair and he sits down. He says, Rifleman Ashton, you can sit down. So I said, I'm waiting for the general. He says, I am the general. So far. Yeah. So I said, he said, um, why are you here? So I started talking about it. He says, I know. And he opened up my medical file. He had it in front of him. He said, you were turned down because your eyesight is too bad. I used, I used to wear glasses. I'm a bit short-sighted. So I'm um, not the best when I lose them, but I can still see. Okay. He said, the concern is that if you happen to lose them in operation, um, that you would not be able to continue and you'd be at risk of not seeing the enemy, not being good in the bush, and you'd be a risk to your team. He says, so I said, I don't care. I want to join the regiment. I want to join the support uh, component of the regiment so I can be of help to the guys. And I said, are you sure? I said, yes, I am. So he duly signed my paperwork and so on. Uh, I went to the stores and now as a permanent force, um, career soldier. I went to go and draw all the kit that they issue. So there's two trunks full of stuff, and they put me onto train to Durban. Got to Durban, I got picked up by a duty officer. Get got taken to the regiment. And the first thing they do, take you in to see the officer commanding. He was one of the founding members of One Ricky, and he was then a major, John Moore. And I went in to go and see him, and he said to me, "Why are you? He why are you here?" Now everybody knows why you're coming because they've been briefed either telephonically or they got in those days a telex to inform them. Um, and I informed him. I said, "This is why I'm here." But I, he said, "Did you really want to do selection course? Do you really want to become operator?" I said, "With everything that I have, I wouldn't have signed up permanent force if I couldn't. But to get closest to the action, if I could, I would." He said, but your glasses are a problem. I said, I've just been issued with contact lenses. In those days, the first soft contact lenses that came out, and I think they were like 1,500 rand each, which in today's terms, you convert it to pounds. It's mostly like 150 pounds. You know, in those days, it was really expensive. Huge. So Major John Moore then said to me, I tell you what, if you really want to become an operator so badly and to do the selection, um, I will turn a blind eye your medical because what they're saying about your eyes is not so bad we can test the theory and the actual practical application of contact lenses you're going to do the selection course the next one coming up but there'd be three months before the next selection course which was due which was in november um so what you need to do then is fall in with the rest of the guys who you were on selection before they all doing their basic courses so the basic courses would be foreign weapons uh, it would be demolitions would be working with small boats and submarines, um, be signals, would be basic medic, medical stuff, uh, driving course to learn to drive all the vehicles and so on. So there were two or three of us that were in the same group. And he said, what I do expect of you is that I don't kick you off, that I've got justification. You need to score more than 85% on all the courses you do. Do through the courses. My average, my average was about 97% in theory and practical. So I loved the courses I was doing, and I got exposed to certain guys who came down 
from Rhodesia who were down. So we had some of the SAS guys who came down to join us. So they were doing basic demolition and they were doing some radio work with us, with us and then also some basic medical training because some of the basic medical training, we went to spend time in the hospitals uh, at night over weekends and casualty stitching up people and bandaging, bandaging them, et cetera. So this is my first introduction to the guys from the SAS. And they would arrive, they'd be just given a uh, local uniform, no insignia, you did not, did not know what rank they were, but from what you deduce when you're working with them, they were anything from the rank of uh, corporal up to sergeant. I think we even had a color sergeant with us at one instance. So you get to know the guys. Love the interaction and so on. And they were talking a lot more about the Bush War, and I thought, this is... This is interesting. I'm I'm very interested in this. Anyway, finished our, our nine month training period. Um, bushcraft tracking survival for me was an absolute holiday. I loved it. There were some people there that just struggled with it. I loved it. It was like being uh, on the farm again. In fact, the first thing that I caught was my instructor in a whip snare. I never owned up to it, but he knew afterwards. He said, "You bastard." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you finish off you finish off bushcraft tracking survival in your last. Big course is what we called uh, minor tactics. And when everything comes together and you live and work in the bush like an operational soldier and sometimes even like a tur, because you really are filthy, um, you don't get a chance to bath and it's really tough. And that's over a period of about eight or nine weeks uh, where you learn to lay ambushes and do all of those things. So now you, you when you finished, you qualified. Um, our selection course group that I had been on um, in November, we started with 45 people who went on our selection course. This is after being whittled down, sorry, not 40, 45, 185. Uh, started on the PT course in Durban. I had to do the PT course all over again, the one that I'd done at Parachute Battalion. Uh, two weeks of misery. Um, our initial group was intake of 861. So 861 whittled down to 185. Uh, after our PT course, there were 45 of us. We did the jumping course in Bloemfontein, and I still had a chance to go to the instructor and say, hey, I said I'll be back, which I <laughs> did. Um, and we jumped into the Caprivi where we did our selection, and when we were finished, there were only 10 of us who passed the selection course. So it's, it's, it was quite strange. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's uh, 8%. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it, it was tough going, but you know, I had somebody on who was a, in, later on my bushcraft tracking and survival instructor who was then a uh, color sergeant or staff sergeant, um, and he said to me, Ashton, you're not going to make it. Now, don't mm. say to me, I can't do it. And that was the inspiration that I needed. And anyway, finished. So after our minor tactics, you now actually qualified, but you're not a fully fledged member of, of the unit until you've actually done an operation. Because if you do an operation, that is when the guys see how you bond with the older guys, whether your training has come together, whether you've got what, it, what they need in terms of uh, fire, when you're under fire, your baptism of fire, how do you handle that? How do you deal with it? So we did a number of small operations, uh, sometimes uh, designated to other groups. We worked with Chief of Staff Intelligence in Angola with UNITA. We did one or two other mine operations. Um, I was designated to a group called Bravo Group. Um, we were the guys that did the work. There was Alpha Group, and these were the glory boys. They did the free fall, and they did all of these things. They went to the nice place. We didn't. We uh, Our group commander was really tough, a guy called Hannes Fenter. And Hannes trained and trained and trained us and grilled us. And often you think, why? And there was an old saying that said, train hard in train hard in training and fight easy in battle. And yeah. it was one of the, he, he used to grind us. And even sometimes on weekends, he said, you guys are doing nothing. Come, we're going to go and do something. And uh, I was by far the youngest um, uh, of our group. Um, I was 19 when I, when I, I was 18 when I passed selection, 19 when I qualified as an operator. And uh, so we'd been involved in some smaller operations. And then the guys who took, um, as they normally would, uh, we've got another operation that's just coming up. Uh, you need to load your kit, um, just bring your basics with you. And they told us what to take, one change of clothing, um, our toiletries and things like that. And uh, they flew us from Durban to Pretoria. And we got on board at Dakota and we flew from Pretoria north over the Matopos and we flew low. They don't call it a vomit comet for nothing. <laughs> yep. And so we got there around about uh, August. And that what month is suicide month in, in Zimbabwe or Rhodesia? October. Okay. Yeah. This is leading up to it. So it's getting pretty warm. For those of you who don't know what suicide month is, 
for both Zambia and Rhodesia, suicide month is when it gets exceptionally hot, and I mean very hot, and there's no rain, and everybody just on everybody's nerves, and people are known to commit suicide because they yeah. can't deal with it. Anyway, so we flew up, uh, went to Salisbury, um, under cover of darkness, we were then taken into um, the barracks, the SAS barracks, and we taken to one side. We weren't supposed to interact or deal with anybody, but there's a place they called the Wing Stagger. This is now one, one Reiki, is that right, so Greek? Uh, yeah, so this is this is Bravo Group from One Reiki. That we now moved, gone up to Salisbury. We've now gone into the SAS barracks. We told not to ming mingle with anybody. And, um, uh, well, did, did you, you have any party. idea? Did you have any idea why you were sent up there? No, on the, on the plane, they told us to change into clothing. So we were issued with fatigues. All of our kit was packed into other stuff and labeled and so on. They said, You're not going to see that again now. You kept except the toiletries. Um, and that was it. So now we we knew where we were. I mean, you you got a good idea when you're flying over the Matapos and so on. You know you know where you're going. Yeah. And we heard rumors of guys being up there because the Alpha Group had been up there, but we hadn't seen or heard anything. They kept it very much under wraps. And um, in fact, as we were landing, um, they were taking off and they were going back, coming back to South Africa. So we ended up that night that we got there. We went down to the Wing Stagger, which was the pub. Um, the guy said, Oh, who are you? And well, the, the, the cat was out of the bag, they knew who it was. So they said, Oh, these are the guys from what was then called D Squadron. Uh, we felt pretty green because you're seeing this clothing, it's still hasn't even been worn in as well with stable belts and things like that. It was really not, not really nice, but and they, they sort of looked at us disdainfully. Uh, how, I don't how, did, were... how did you feel putting on radiation camouflage? Was it alien? Was it you know, just it wasn't, it wasn't. There was. It was foreign because we tend to work outside of the country when we did in greens. Mm -hmm. um, I'd worked in a number of other, in many years later, in other, in other um, uh, fatigues in different colors. I worked in Rice Fleck. I'd worked in British. I'd worked in Tanzania. And I worked in all different colors. So this was like the first time. But also because you're now with Rhodesians, it, you feel like you're usurping their pride in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not really a Rhodesian. Uh, Greg, for, for the sake yeah. of my international viewers, behind your head is an example of the radiation camouflage. I believe it's been yes. rated the fifth most effective in the world. And if I'm not I'm mistaken, sorry. I'd like to be corrected on this. It was designed by a woman um, doodling on a napkin, and it became printed eventually. And so by your right ear is the, the wings and dagger of the SAS, who wins theirs. And if you could yeah. shift, shift your head slightly... We'll see the the insignia of uh, one Rick. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Right. So you've now arrived in Salisbury. You, you don't know what you're there for. You're in uh, radiation uniform, and um, can you take it on from there? Sure. So, um, yeah, you're feeling a little bit spare, to use sort of a colloquial term. You're in somebody else's uniform. You're in foreign ground. You know that something is about to happen. Operations, undoubtedly. What we don't know. So. Um, we were most of the next morning. Um, we were briefed uh, by the local, uh, by the intel officer from the um, squadron, or took us through various things, the do's and the don'ts, and what we can and what our uh, cover story was if we had to go out into town or anything like that. And we would be given a basic course of orientation. Uh, just so that we could fit in with the rest of them. If we had to work with anybody from C Squadron, what would happen? Um, I don't think they knew exactly what they were going to do with us then. Although um, our um, Alpha Group had been working down south in the Cheretsian Triangle area at a place called Mabola Uta, uh, where we ended up going as well. But we didn't know at that stage. And because of the war was changing very much on the Russian front, which was on the eastern highlands, if you go from Buffalo Range all the way up to Umtali and into Mozambique, things were changing. And I didn't know, and I think they didn't know exactly how they're going to utilize us. I'm sure there was a bigger plan. Um, so we were given, given a basic orientation. I remember meeting with a lot of the uh, senior guys, uh, the senior NCOs. I was still only a one striper in those days. So you don't really have much say in the matter. I need to add at that stage that a whole lot of guys from Turecki had joined us as well. Now, Turecki was a citizen force or territorial regiment um, in based in Johannesburg. And there must have been eight or nine of them who came up uh, with us on the trip. 
Um, so they were part and parcel of the team. And it was really great to have them there because they gave us a different perspective. And we we knew some of them, some of them we'd done operations with as well. And the citizen force guys or the territorial guys, if they're not rusty and they can't do everything else, they add immense value to any regiment like ours, I assume even with the SAS um, and various other regiments, if you look at the RLI and things like that, exactly the same. So we were, had to undergo some basic training, and that's how they worked with an LMG, light machine gun. We were under the tutelage of uh, Sergeant Johnny Masson, um, who took no prisoners. It was really uh, tough because the Rhodesian way of doing things was a little bit different to the South African way of doing things. But you know what? You adapt quickly. No, you don't do this. You do that and so on. Very much more British, where the South Africans had learned very much more the South African Afrikaans uh, adaptation of the uh, old British methodology in terms of the schooling at uh, in the military. Yeah. Um, so we did that for about a week and a half. And then they told us we were ready. We've been shipped out. We had no idea where we were going to. And by Dakota, and they flew us down south to a little place called Mabala Huta, which is on the Nuanesi River. It's near Chiretsian Triangle. We thought it was a nice area. Meantime, this is one of the main infiltration routes for looks coming up the Nuanesi River. Absolutely. Uh, and when we got there, it was a real bush camp. We Everybody's got their little bivvies that they're sleeping under. They told us, that's where you're going to go and lie over there. And the other guys are there inside where the trenches were. Uh, you need to know where the long drops are, where the ops room is, and where the kitchen is, more importantly. And where the vehicle park was, and we were right on the landing strip. And uh, nice thing, they don't tell you about some of the things there. There's a little red ant that you get down there. And at nighttime, if you don't know about it, you go to sleep. And you wake up at night like we all did, and you hear this squeaking noise, like tweet, 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 tweet. <clears throat> no idea what it is. And with your little torch, you shine down on yeah. to see what it is. your sleeping bag is just covered in these yeah. things. And yeah. they get into anything and they bite like crazy. Being so the first night, night first night you don't sleep. And then later on you learn what to do. You put up your bivy and you drink trenches around, you pour diesel in all the time, and that's the way it works. Even your guide rope, your guy ropes that you have, even put diesel on that so they can't get in. Hey, and it was great being there. Um, they gave us a bit of uh, time to uh, adapt. We played volleyball during the day. It's flipping hot down there and dry. Um, this is now going into October. There were a lot of guys from Sea Squadron who were there. They were recuperating. There was a guy called Wayne Ross Smith, who's deceased now. Um, Wayne joined us many years later at One Wrecking. And a few other guys, they'd been in contact with it, uh, gone into a military base they'd attacked. And Wayne had got shot up quite badly. So they wanted to utilize the guys and not feel sorry for them having them home at the base, but put them into where they could do some use. So he's walking around on crutches and there were a few other guys there as well. And they sort of gave us some of the basic uh, lay of the land rules and things you do and don't do. And within two days, we got our first ops uh, briefing and we were going to do what Alpha Group had done, go into the Russian front. And the only way to get there was by Dakota at night. They drop you off by parachute. And uh, our brief was to go in and to really um, create havoc for the enemy. So the enemy is Frelimo at this stage. And Frelimo was supporting um, Zanla. Zebra was coming out of um, out of uh, Zambia at that stage. So this was primarily Zanla that was coming over. And there were a lot of them. Um, and our our objective was to lay ambushes uh, for as many as we could get to enable the security forces to also pinpoint where the Zanla uh, military camps were. So we went in. So they drop in by parachute at night, um, stow away your parachute, um, take it out if you could. Rarely it didn't happen. Um, and then early in the, you'd be there that night, you'd be in the, um, um, in encampment where, in, where you are lying for the night and, um, on guard duty the next morning early, we'd be going out. We, we had maps we were working off, and invariably we were laying ambushes on the roads or the railway tracks or if somebody we knew was coming along. And this is what we did for months on end. They drop in at night, and uh, you do the operation. You'd be there for two or three days, sometimes a bit longer. You're only a team of six, so sometimes two teams of six. So sometimes there could be 12, but invariably teams of six. Um, it's fine if you're laying ambushes and you scoot and run. But it's a problem when you run into larger groups, which are battalion sized. Often, mm. it would happen. Um, and were, and we, were you mixed in with the SAS guys, or did the South African guys uh, operate separately? We were oper we were operating separately. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, Sea Squadron was operating, uh, I think, out of Umtali and further north out of Kariba, um, and also at one stage in Wanki. There was stuff there because I ended up going to all of those places on standby at a later stage where I had to go and stand in to go and assist uh, some of our guys that were there, uh, but I wasn't operationally involved at that stage. I'll, I'll touch on that briefly later. How, how did just start getting into the stage where I'd like to start asking questions? Um, how did you feel fighting for Adish at this point? I mean, it sounds like they hadn't even asked you. Um, did it did it meet with any resentment or rejection from the guys? Not at all. Uh, if anything, I think the guys were really gung ho and eager. I think some guys hadn't had the chance of having real uh, fights on their hands. I think they really wanted to. Um, and I think the 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 law of the bush and bush law, L O R E, and also the stories that you hear and things that you see, we knew how good the Rhodesian soldiers were. Whether you were conventional infantry, whether we were RLI, RAR, SAS, scouts, it didn't really make a difference. The guys were really good. Um, and the Air Force, you never took for granted. We saw what the Air, the Air Force was capable of, especially with the little twin-engine Cessnas and the various uh, other aircraft. And the links, yeah. The, yeah, the links. And, and the pilots were amazing, especially on the Alouettes. Mm. I yeah. took my hat off to the Alouettes. And you know, when you've got an Alouette which is stripped down, you're sitting on a plank in the back because you're making it as light as possible to carry a team of six. It's not designed to carry a team of six, but the pilot is now getting the most out of it to carry a team of six, and you're heavily laden. I mean, your backpack is weighing mm. 70, 80, 90 kilos because most of it is water, then ammo, mm. uh, and not just your own ammunition, but also that for the mortar uh, that you're carrying, and then a little, a little bit of food, and then maybe something else. Uh, I was the signaler, so I had the big radio, and the radio needs a lot of spare batteries, so you're carrying that immediately. You don't have much space in your backpack. Um, so lead us into a, a situation where you actually engaged the enemy or saw the results of your land mine, mine laying. Is, uh, could you give us an overview of that, maybe? Yep, I can. So we got to a stage where flying in from Abaluta was was too far, and they decided they were going to move us to Buffalo Range. Mm. Um, and there's not much at Buffalo Range. I mean, they don't want you to go anywhere else. So you've got, you got the airstrip and so on there, and this is where we were camped out and where we were working. And we bumped into a few guys there from the scouts and from Sea Squadron and people coming through, but they told us to keep our distance. And on this particular op, they, they didn't have planes to drop us off, and they said we're going to have to walk in. So we had the engineers take us to the minefield. So for those who don't know, that eastern side of the border, there's a long strip that is – uh, got mines in it, so it's been laid out. You've got all different types of mines. You've got those that are triggered by by wire trigger mechanisms, those who pick up oh, heat and movement. Yes, the plowshare, yeah. and all of the other stuff. And then these guys take you through, and you've got to step on exactly where the other guys have mm -hmm. stepped on and you go through. So we then had to walk in on the operation. So we were going down, uh, walking in about 30, 35 kilometers into where there was a military base. Um, there were a lot of locals, and our job was to go in and create as much havoc as we can. There were some infiltration routes in rows that were being used for resupply, and our job was to lay ambushes, cause the havoc, and then shoot and scoot and, and get out again. Um, I just remember the Mopani flies walking down those gobbles. Now, I'm the signaler. So every time we stop, we walk for an hour and rest for five minutes. And when it gets very hot, your radio signal doesn't carry. So the base is not getting, uh, when we're doing our, our scheduled um, report, we couldn't raise them. We couldn't raise them and we're struggling and so on. And there's a photograph that somebody took of me. I've got a face veil over my face like this. You can't see me. I look like a gingerbread man. I've just got my pot flies all over me. Yeah. And you know, the worst thing about you, squish one and then that you seem to attract everybody and his cousin. Four, four million come to the funeral. <laughs> yeah and, so and, and the mosquitoes at night i mean i i almost refused to go back into that area because of the mozzies they were dreadful luckily that time of the year when you go in in september october it's fairly dry you higher up in the gommels before you you go down into the valleys to, to where we were so there were less mosquitoes there and we covered a lot of ground on the first day i think we covered about 25 k's or the 35 we had to cover so we were still at, in the foothills but we weren't in, in our target destination um, and we were still struggling with comms. Um, they sent up um, a plane high up, and then on HF radio, we could communicate with them, but the plane's got to be very high. And of course, the guys know if there's a plane up in the area, there's there's some activity somewhere. I mean, they're not, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we then crossed the last bit of the uh, high terrain, the Gomels, going down in the pine, the pine trees, getting down into the bottom of the valleys. And once we got down there, it was late afternoon, there were a lot of locals in the area. But we had to then sort of find a way so that they wouldn't see us. You think they're not going to see you. These guys know everything. They're, they're amazing. So, so we think we're, gonna, we're sneaking in. So we followed. We're walking in water in a little uh, stream that's going up. It's marshy. It's muddy and so on. There were cattle and so on. And I remember then we had to cross a big river, but it was nighttime. Uh, across the river, we, one of the guys lost his boots. Uh, for whatever reason, he took them off uh, to, to cross through because the, the, the thought was crossover and on barefoot, if they see your barefoot, they're going to know. Look, the white man's foot is not used to, it's very different to the black man's foot and the black man has been walking barefoot all the time. His foot shape is very different. You can see it. Yeah. Um, so we crossed through, we lay in the reeds all night, uh, early morning, we then moved up. We saw there was too much of the local population there, so we went into a, th a thicket. So now there are three teams of six, so there are 18 of us in there. There's quite a lot of firepower we're ready to do, I think. And we're sitting there, now we're waiting. But there are too many people moving around. And then the people would know who worked in the areas like this, you hear the sound of a cowbell. Ding, ding. Ding, ding. ding, ding yeah. So the people who don't know... Um, when the locals who work there and they work with the militia and they work with the local uh, military in the area, if they spot something or know something's afoot, literally afoot, and they see a sign of that, they get the little herd boy with his cows to walk with his herd of cattle because he's no threat to anybody to walk around. And this guy sees everything. He knows everything. And we heard the cowbell. And eventually the cowbell had done a complete 360 around, I think. it. In the meantime, in the meantime I've got to raise comms with with uh, HQ because you can't get through to them and I'm struggling. I can't get my my slant wire up on my HF on my VHF uh, HF radio to get up high enough. So I decide, brilliant idea. I'm going to use my knife. Here's the knife that I was carrying in those days. So that's the knife thing. Now normally your knife is dull and blackened, but yeah. idiot Ashton has a very nice shiny blade. <laughs> Yeah. So what do I do? I, 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 it's a nice survival knife. It's expensive. So if you see that thing over there, you can see it. Yeah. Can you see beautiful, it? Beautiful yeah. knife. Yeah. So um, I tie the the end of the rope to to the antenna, and I throw it up into the tree. Now, when you're throwing a knife into a tree and you're playing and you're throwing knives, you want the blade to go into the tree and to do it. When you're using it as a way to go over, because there's only sand there, you want it to go between the trees and over. And what happened every time? The knife would get stuck in the tree. Now I'm trying to pull it, and the tree's doing this. <laughs> of course, our, our group commander, uh, Andre Didricks, who's passed on now, was really angry with me, and he said, you've got to do something about it. First of all, he talked to my section head, and who then ripped a strip off me. Anyway, I put a piece of wood on the end, onto then stabbed in properly. Then I could use this very shiny, nice thing to throw up in the air and through the branches, pull the antenna up. And for the first time in two days, we were able to make um, a schedule communication with HQ. Told them what was happening. And they said, oh, they had a spot to plane up. And they said there were a lot of uh, militia in the area. And they had moved in some of the local Frelimo guys. So it'd be best for us if we move because um, – Things were not going to be very nice very soon. Well, they hadn't even finished that when the guys opened on open up fire with us, on us. They RPGs. Um, they had eighty two mil mortars, and I think they had some of those B tens as well. Mm -hmm. and we were in the thick of it at the moment, and the guys in escape, escape and evasion plan B, uh, not plan A anymore. And we knew where we had to go because part of your training, you demarcate or you allocate um, a, a point, a rendezvous point, should anything happen. But when we came out of that bush, it was like going to a wedding. And I don't mean song and dance. The confetti that came down on us. And that confetti was the trees, uh, the tree leaves and the bark and everything else. Thank goodness these guys shoot high. Yeah. But when I say, and you don't hear the sound, it's funny. You and years later when you get used to it, yes, you hear the sound of fire. But I think this was like the first really big firefight when I was on the receiving end. Yeah. Oh, you don't hear anything for the yeah. first I think for the first 30 seconds, you don't hear anything. And I think it's like slow motion. But we knew what we had to do. So we had to run across these open fields. So you got sorghum and maize and beans and everything else. And there are ant heaps here and there. And who takes, posi who takes uh, position on the ant heaps? The militia guys. Is. So he's sitting with his AK on the thing, taking pot shots at you. So we took out a few of the guys as we were running. There was some guy with an, RP, uh, with an RPG who took more shots. Uh, he gapped it because he didn't have any more ammo. And then somebody with a light machine gun, which I assume was an RPD. None of us were hit. 
You know, we're in open plain field. I mean, it's just an issue of training. And we had to run. We had to cover a distance of about four or five kilometers open field. So we stopped, regroup, go down into a defensive position, uh, fire, uh, sometimes do a bit of fire and movement, uh, neutralize whoever was uh, creating a problem for us and then continue running um, as we had to until we got to the river which we had to cross again, which is the Limpopo River, uh, cross the river. And at this stage, the heavy the heavies had come in. So there were some BRDMs and they had 82 more mortars uh, and B-10s and they were firing them at us. Um, you cross the river on that particular place where you were and you've got to climb the embankment the other side. But the embankment is about four or five meters high. And it's not easy to get up. We managed to get some guys up and there was rope. We pulled all the guys up, got to the top. We're soaking wet at this stage. Uh, it was getting dusk and we they carried on firing at us. So they were doing sporadic fire with the 82 mil mortar, chased us all over the place. None of us were hit. We were you know, pretty good uh, spirits as well. We wanted to go back and go and take them on again. And our orders were, no, first of all, regroup and under the cover of darkness, we'll get further instructions in, which we did. Um, their vehicles moved close and the whole night they were doing sporadic fire. They were trying to either locate where we were, hopefully we would respond with fire so they could or not. And we didn't. So we went into the lower area of the Gommels and we were there for the night. Um, and then they said, no, we need to, we need to move out of here. So early morning, um, was at first light already, um, we packed up and ready to go. And what taken us a day and a half to, to cover when we came in, we walked out in about seven hours. Now you're carrying all of your equipment. You haven't, ex you, you spent, expended very little, a little bit of your food, a little bit of your ammo and some of your water. So seven hours, we were back at the boundary uh, fence where we had to go through the minefield again. We get to the other side. What are we going to do? No, you got to go back again. Load up with more ammo, more stuff. We went back down again into it. And then we laid some ambushes. Um, and it was nice. When I say nice, nice for us. We hit ambushes, small teams like 10 or 12 guys. We hit some single guys walking along the railway track. And it's, you know, when you've got a well-oiled machine that's running, you have your guys which are laid out. So now we we 18 of us in this group. You've got your early warning guys out there, your scouts, and you've got people behind you. And this is when you're on, on a uh, road. We had some landmines which we planted as well because the vehicles were coming through. We never heard any of the vehicles uh, being detonated on um, or detonating any of the mines. But while we were busy doing this, we had guys who walked through. And obviously, then you have to withdraw your mine planting team and um, you have to initiate the ambush. We did that uh, on one road in that particular scene. And then in another op um, later on, we did the same thing. And we also did... Um, on the railway track. But the guys walk on the railway track. They don't expect, expect somebody like there, uh, like us there. Some of them got their rifles over their shoulder, walking along, talking like they out for the Sunday afternoon, but, you know, um, going off to a soccer match or something like that. So we did a lot of operations like that. Um, I remember seeing one of the guys and I th from SAS, who, from Sea Squadron, who'd uh, landed on some sandalwood. Now, sandalwood in that area, um, what happens is when the fire when the fires burn, the inside of the sandalwood burns out and the outer hardwood stays behind. <clears throat> really, really hard. They make those chairs out of it, with your lo which the locals make chairs, and they put the one piece into the other, but you pull it out, you can collapse and put it in your head. But the stuff stands like this, and it's normally really sharp. And I remember a guy uh, landing on this at night. And when he went in through his, the side of his calf muscle, out the back of his calf, into his, the back of his thigh and out the front. I mean, he was, he was really in a bad state. And you, what, what are you going to do? You Cut, you cut as much as you can, but you've got a chasm vacuum like that. We had guys who walked into a swarm of bees. Now, nobody trains you for something like this. And this time of the year, the bees are very angry and they're moving. And the guys walk, walked into a swarm of bees. And we had to send the helicopter in to, to pick them up. And they were eyes were swollen shut on some of them. They, they, they couldn't see a thing. And the one guy, it was close to going to anaphylactic shock due to all of the, the bees things. You know, doing this type of operation was, was different in many respects. Yeah. Um, so your armament changes as well. We had guys who who used the uh, Browning um, semi-automatic shotguns with the extended magazine so they could carry eight rounds with them. And for close quarters in the bush, it's an excellent weapon. Get out into the open, you're useless. We also used to carry um, uh, silenced uh, AK-47s as well because we used AKs for our operations there. And the silence AK-47 is fine to use if you're using for the purpose where it needs to be silent. Get into a firefight, it's useless because you've got a subsonic round. They've adapted the round so it doesn't make the noise. And you 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 have a problem. So the guys with the 
with the LMGs or the RPDs or PKMs uh, in terms of machine gun power are the guys that they need to come to the fore. But when you're then down to six-man teams, which we mostly were, um, we got to a stage where we decided we weren't going to carry silenced um, AK-47s. The guys had carried a 2-2 Beretta, uh, which with a silence on it. And, you know, it's very much like the Mossad um, in Israel used to use a silence uh, to, to, to eliminate people. But you're going to be right, quite close to these guys to be able to do it. When I say close, you know, within this distance. And a guy who's going to be... Um, who knows he's going to die with the possibility. Trust me, he's going to fight. Yeah. He's really going to fight. So, yeah. So we, we, we did a lot of these ops over a period of time. Eventually you feel like you, you're going to the supermarket. You're just in and out and in and out and in and out. And you don't have much of a reprieve. Then the rains, then the rains came yeah. and uh, the vehicles were having a problem getting in and out. And they thought we need a bit of R and R. So they sent us back to Salisbury um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. I uh, went to the Monomotapo, we went to Cockdaw and places like that that maybe we shouldn't have. Uh, got into a bit of trouble. Um, I was driving a whole group of guys just as a duty officer for the day, and I was driving one of the crocodiles, you know, the big armor plated vehicles on the Mercedes chassis, and driving through the suburbs, the back end of the Monomotapo. And you can't see out of these things. I mean, you've got the hatch in front and a little bit on the side, and I said to uh, my co-driver, I said to him, can I turn left? Is it fine? Because you've got to take quite a wide berth to go left. But he was reading something and he said, yeah, you can turn left. He looked up. He didn't really look carefully. Anyway, I turned left. I thought, gee, this thing is not going well, you know. Changed down, the, changed down from second gear into first and I pull forward like this. And as I'm carrying on driving, people are jumping in the road and doing this and trying to stop me. I said, What's it about? So I pulled over, get out the hatch at the top. The guy says, did you not see that mini on the side of the road? I said, what mini? They said, well, exactly what mini? <laughs> there, was a, there was a little mini being driven by a student on the left of me. He snuck in and he shouldn't have. I mean, this is an uneducated driver. He snuck in and I was a bit away from the pavement because I knew I was going to turn left, but he was there and he was a youngster. His money had, uh, he bought it secondhand and he, his folks had given him a lot of money and he really dolled this thing up because he showed us photographs of it, of it afterwards. It was beautiful. Do you remember that Martin's Marvelous Money you used to get in the British uh, cartoons? Yeah. It was that. It was really nice little money. Well, I'd squashed this thing up against the tree and there was a lamp pole over there. Well, there, were, there was nothing left of this. And there was a bit of paintwork off there and the one fender on the side of the of the crocodile had been bent slightly, and that was it. There was no damage. But anyway, I had to fill in the incident report and do all of those things. 